I'm M. Sauter, better known as Pints and Panels. And I'm Don Tess, better known as the Dawn of Beer. Welcome to the 22nd episode of the All About Beer podcast. Every two weeks, we talk with leading experts and take a deep dive into one topic in beer. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer. And if you're feeling generous, visit us at patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. This week on the show, we're going to be talking about beer festivals and not just any beer festivals. The logistics, the know-how, the info, the sweat it takes to take some of the best beer festivals in the world come together. And we're going to have two excellent guests to help explain what goes into making a successful beer festival. Don, give me some thoughts on beer festivals. <laughs> um, I love beer festivals. Um, as most people know, I love tasting new beers. And to me, there's no better place to do that than at a well-curated beer festival and you know, hanging around with like-minded people and you get to taste new beers, have fun, learn something. I think good festivals aren't just a bunch of of beers together, but they, you know, let you taste a couple things side by side, for example, and learn something. So yeah, I'm I'm all over that. Um so you know what's not to love about beer festivals. I like, I will say I like unique beer festivals. Ones that stand out, make people feel welcome and do more than just you remember those beer festivals from like 10 years ago where everyone just stood in a parking lot <laughs> and, <laughs> and drank? Like, those are not great. Uh, they can be fun because you're hanging out with friends, but a lot of them just. Felt... I think there was a time and a place for them because sure, when beer was young, was. you know, but yeah. but now, yes, we are we're in a new world now. I like how we're moving away from those to into festivals that have more emphasis on culture. And we're going to talk to Dave Bracey about that, which is great in yeah. his Barrel and Flow Looking Festival. To that. Yeah. Um, you know, a curation of lists. When we talked to Laura from like Big Beers in Belgian Barley like Barley Wines Festival, like that's those are curated events that have a purpose. Um, I feel like when your festival has a purpose and a theme, it can really elevate it. Yes. And those are what I look for when I go to a festival. Uh, and plus festivals that take care of people, you know, make sure that they have, you know, sexual harassment guidelines, brewery guidelines, there's water stations, there's food stations. I mean, there's so when you when we talk to these guests, we get a lot of questions about how to make sure people are taken care of. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I don't. Yeah. Like, you know, again, time and a place for drinking in a parking lot. But I think the more I think the, those days are yeah. gone. Yeah. But are, I don't think so. <laughs> that doesn't uh, mean like I don't I mean, I sound like an old like coot right now, but, you know, there's a time and a place for those. And if you want to go to those, that's fine. But if I'm going to a beer festival. You know, I want it to be a special experience where I get to try new beers, I get to see some people that I really like try beers I don't normally have. Yeah, uh, more experience than, you know, here's a plastic sample cup. And, you know, maybe a hamburger. <laughs> steam, I don't steam know. ham. Yeah, steam. <laughs> anyway, we'll get uh, introduce her guests and get into a conversation. But first, here is a word from our sponsor. And if you'd like to help support the All About Beer podcast, reach out to podcast at allaboutbeer.com. Estrella Galicia is an independent family-owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world-class lager, brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the state-of-the-art facility in Acruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. Looking for an easy hop sourcing experience? Yakima Valley Hops offers the finest quality hops from right here in our valley and premium growing regions around the world. Get the hops you need when you need them with ultra fast shipping and awesome customer service. With a full line of liquid hop products and all your favorite varieties, no contracts are needed to brew with the best. Shop now at yakimavalleyhops.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A, valleyhops.com. Dave Bracey is a comedian, co-host of the award-winning Drinking Partners podcast, Ed and Day in the Burke TV series, and the founder of the Barrel and Flow Fest. When he isn't freelance drinking, he's paying Black people and trolling bigots online. Welcome to the show, Day. Uh, thanks for having me. So for those who don't know, um, can you explain about Barrel and Flow and how it got started? Because I'm a, I'm a big Barrel and Flow fan. 
Um, and I've never been, so I would like the explanation. You are missing out, sir. <laughs> um, so yeah, please tell everyone all about Barrel and Flow. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, Barrel and Flow is a festival um, that uh, seeks to uh, bring more diversity into the brewing industry, specifically um, folks from the Black community. Um, through mutually beneficial relationships and partnerships um, and the celebration of Black culture and art. Um, we, uh, started, we started in 2018 as Fresh Fest. Um, I'm a comedian and producer uh, and a podcaster as well. Um, we uh, have a podcast called Drinking Partners. Uh, we saw um, after a couple of years of being in comedy that um, comedy was just an excuse to keep people drinking, uh, for three hours at these establishments. Um, you know, I would see, you know, I, I've worked in the, uh, restaurant industry, the food beverage industry my whole life. Uh, so I kind of understand the economics behind things. And, you know, I would see all this, like, you know, beer and alcohol being poured. Um, and then, you know, kind of like look at, you know, my pay and be like, well, why am I the only one not really getting paid well as a result of all of this? Um, so, you know, we, uh, we started a podcast. We wanted to get our name out there. We um, we hooked up with the brewing industry, which allowed us to um, kind of cut out the middleman, um, you know, venues and other you know uh, folks, and actually start working directly with the suppliers. Um, so we would uh, host events that featured free pours, samples of you know local craft beer. We would have them on a podcast. We would promote them throughout the month, we would have them introduce them to our audiences at these comedy shows. Um, and it worked out really well. Um, you know, our fans love to be introduced to new brews. Um, you know, the brewers like to be introduced to new fans. Uh, the comedians like to be introduced to new folks. Uh, and we were able to raise our ticket prices because, you know, we were giving out free beverages and things of that nature. So we were able to pay our artists more as well, which meant a higher quality of show. Um, and it just was all around, you know, a, a great thing. Um, and we noticed that we were the only black folks kind of in the area uh, that were doing anything like this. So um, we started to fest with the intention of bringing more black folks into the industry, you know, kind of seeing that like the two major forms of, of uh, you know, uh, funding for entertainment, whether you're a baseball team or a musician or a comedian, um, is alcohol and grant funding. Um, so, you know, 14% of sales, something along that lines being, uh, black, uh, yet less than 1%, um, ownership or, uh, uh evolvement. So, you know, we want to kind of like raise that number with this festival through these mutually beneficial relationships, collaborations, um, you know, shows and things of that nature. Um, and yeah, I mean, we started in 2018 and. I don't know. I feel like I've been telling this story for so long that like, I don't even know. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's all jumbled, but basically, you know, we sort of defess, it popped. Um, a lot of things happened between now and then, but uh, we won some awards. Uh, we had some ups and some downs and now we're here in our sixth year uh, and we're expecting, you know, 4,000 people to come in August 12th uh, for this fest with, uh, you know, a hundred or so breweries represented. 30 of which are black um, and a lot of food and vendors and just kind of ca carrying on that mission of, uh, you know, inclusivity and uh, mutually beneficial economic relationships. Pittsburgh is a great beer town. So you're very lucky in that regard. Um, are they, because I I went in 2021 and you had streets blocked off and you had a lot of space. Are they cool to work with are they do they you know how hard i'm actually really interested in the permitting and you know when you go to a city like pittsburgh and you're like hey i want to throw this festival i need this and this and this like how receptive were they to what you were trying to accomplish well fuck pittsburgh first and foremost okay. um i mean like you know i love pittsburgh <laughs> yeah i, I do I, I love pittsburgh i love the people here i love my people here or whatever it is an extreme you've been here um mm -hmm. It's an extremely, there, yeah. white, it's extremely white. Um, it's extremely archaic in a, a lot of the ways that they do things. It's slow moving. Um, mm -hmm. Most of our support from the beginning came from outside of the city, um, as is ought to happen here. Uh, they are not kind to black people. They are not mm -hmm. kind to new things. 
Um, and we are we are woefully underfunded and undersupported, um, not only in this event, but just as you know, black people in general in this region, which is why this festival was so important for this region. There were no really large black celebrations in this city. You know what I mean, like Juneteenth became a thing. Um, so we we now have that. And you're starting to see more events pop up. Um, but when we started, there weren't black, you know, large black festivals or celebrations whatsoever. Um, so it was it was difficult and it continues to be difficult um, in this region to find the support and, you know, to continue to do do that, because, um, you know, anytime we we as black folks raise our voices, there are, you know, thousands of white folks who want to, you know, you know, tap us down and go, well, why is it got to be about that, you know, and gaslight us uh, into oblivion. So, um, you know, the it, there wasn't a lot of support um, here in the beginning and, and still isn't. But the the unique thing about Pittsburgh, or I guess one of the, the good things about like mid-market cities is that um, you can make a lot of impact in a short period of time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, you know, we while we didn't get a lot of support from say like the larger city and, and various organizations, we do have a very strong dedicated group of folks um, that are, you know, like are willing to put in the hard work to get us, you know, to, to, to maintain this festival um, throughout the years and whatnot. So, you know, the breweries here are really closely uh, knit, you know, uh, I believe the larger industry was like that in a lot of these uh, older, you know, areas where craft beer has been there for a while. Um, but, you know, as I've traveled, I see that like these markets are like heavily saturated. The camaraderie isn't there quite as much as it is in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's a lot looser and harder to, you know, make those connect connections and headway um, as a result. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, whether it's the comedy that we do, whether it's beer, whether it's you know, anything that we do is just this mid-market city allows us to make those connections um, more quickly. Um, also, the cost of living here is really cheap. Um, so, you know, bringing people into the city, it's really easy to kind of like say, hey, you know, fly into Pittsburgh. Once you buy the, the, the flight um, and, you know, your hotel, everything else is like pretty cheap. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, you know, taking a trip to like South America or something like that. Right. You know I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like, just get the flight in the hotel and you can live like a King off of a couple hundred bucks. Right. So that's, that's kind of our sales pitch for Pittsburgh. Um, and the property values are really cheap here as well. So we're hoping that, you know, black folks will come in, see the city, see the opportunities they're in and want to bring their, you know, um, their, their coastal incomes to Pittsburgh. Cause you can work remotely now. Um, and, you know, build something that they couldn't build in, say, a New York or a California. Wow. It's a, yeah, it's a great city, you know, I mean, the infrastructure is decent. Yeah, the cost of living is low. I guess I, I really it was on our short list when we were looking for places to live, especially I have family there. But it's a great, yeah. And the beer scene in Italy is super strong. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to ask about uh, Barrel and Flow isn't just a beer festival we were talking that before we started recording um i've give you've done you do conference there's a conference beforehand there's music there's art i mean how do you get people to come to stuff like that like what's the draw for learning i mean i guess it's a good learning experience i really enjoyed the conference i thought it was great yeah yeah no and, and thank you for participating in it um you know the the draw really is um that like we're doing what other people aren't um mm -hmm. most beer festivals are trash let's just be very clear like most of them um are they, you know they don't pay their staff you don't know who the hell's pouring the beer you can barely get any knowledge from anybody it's a bunch of like drunk bearded flannel white dudes trying to get the highest abv like booze um you know like it's just like I went to a couple before we started barrel and flow and I was immediately like the first one I was like I can't believe we can drink all we want and then after that, what else was there? You know what I mean? Like there wasn't much else going on except for like getting shit faced and passing out in the sun. Um, then like, what was that festival that just happened? The, um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the Kings of the Floyd, three Floyds. Oh, the they Dark had, Lord Day. Like, yeah, the Dark Lord Day or whatever. You know what I mean, there's pictures coming out of like all these like random white dudes pass out in the, in the lawn or whatever. You know what I mean, first and foremost, if you do that in Pittsburgh with black people, there's going to be heavy arrests going on. So, you know, we can't do that. Um, but I mean, 
you know, so the, the draw is, you know, uh, that we we won, uh, we build a festival that's more than just beer. Um, you know, we we focus on black culture and the culture around beer, the music, the food, the networking, because that's what beer should be, right? Like, I, I'm, I love I love Beauty. beer. I love talking about it. This and the other, but like the cool kids don't want to just stand around and talk about fucking hops all day. You know what I mean? Like that's not. <laughs> you know what I mean, like that's like I can't invite my friends to that shit. You know what I mean? I can't get jiggy to that shit. So it's like you know, if I wanted to, I wanted to build a fest that my my homeboys would go to, really. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like you know, the folks you know back home would go to, and they wouldn't go to these drunken lot fests. So having music there, having food there, um, you know, having these networking opportunities because. This is economics. Craft beer is an economic term. You know what I mean, it's circular economics. It means that I I know where my dollar is going and that if I give you this money, maybe you'll support me in return. Right. I've never met Anheuser or Bush. I don't know Coors <laughs> or like, you know, what I mean, or Miller. Right. Yeah. But I know Trace. I know the owner of Trace. <laughs> I know the owner of, you know, Hitchhiker Brewing and things of that nature. So when I support them, they support me. And like I said, I mean, that that economic opportunity we get a lot of black women that come to this festival that don't drink beer or alcohol in any kind of in any way but they come because two things one of the economic opportunity and then two because of the other selling point is that is the inclusivity right uh we build a festival with um with everyone in mind and when you build something a society for like you know something like you know there was a quote Kaiser had mentioned to me, you know, a while back that if you build a society with the least herd in mind, then you make it better for everyone. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we started building this festival, I was going around to brewers and going, what do you hate about festivals? I was going to mm -hmm. musicians. What do you hate about festivals? I was going to women. What do you hate about festivals? I was going to the LGBTQ community. What do you hate about festivals? Right. And getting all this feedback. You know, I mean, the, the disabled community. Hey, what do you hate about this? And by getting all this feedback, we were able to build a festival that nobody hated. You know what I mean, and, you know, and, 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 and being so entrenched in the surf, in the food service industry, you know, like, I, I, I like to say, you know, who's going to service the servicemen, right? Like mm -hmm. this festival is one, like the biggest compliment that we got in this festival was year two, when, you know, uh, a friend of mine was like, she was like, Hey, I'm getting off of work. She worked at a brewery. She's like, I'm getting off of work and I can't wait to come to your festival. Like, you know how hard it is yeah. to get industry people to want to come to an industry event? Like, you, you know what I mean? But, like, that's the thing is that, like, we think of them when we're doing this. And we pay them. This year, we're paying our staff $20 to $25 an hour um, awesome. you know I mean? to do that, right? Like, you know, our first year was volunteer. Since then, mm -hmm. we've paid our staff. Um, you know, we pay above industry rates for our um, our artists, uh, our speakers, our, yeah, you know I mean, like, you know, we really, when we look at this festival, we're not just trying to have a drunken lot fest slash cash grab, which is a lot of what these beer festivals are. They've lost the point. Mm. We're really trying to support the industry. We're really trying to um, uplift a a community and really like take the the model of festing into the future. You know I mean, it's old. It's it's and like it's just it doesn't work anymore. It, it only works for a small group of people and that's typically the venue that gets paid and the producers who don't pay anybody else and run home with the cash everybody else there is, is miserable even the even like you know a lot of like the the, the partners that come to the festival because you always you know there's always like the guy that's like dragging somebody with them at the festival right <laughs> and i mean and like you know everybody's miserable except for him so you know with this like you know we have something that if you don't drink you still want to come because it's a festival first and beer second yeah, there's music, there's food. It last how long is Barrel and Flow? Like you uh, it goes for certain days, but like the festival the itself. The festival it, is yeah. like the, the, the day of is 12 to 9. So we have yeah. three hours of of a of a VIP portion, which is catered mm -hmm. um and has exclusive beers and whatnot. Then we have the early access, which is three to five, and then we have the the general admission, which is five to nine. And in that we have two music stages, four art stages. 30 goods and service vendors, 30 food vendors, 15 nonprofits, and then 75 Ooh. just for brewers. And in each of those breweries, they're either black owned or they're collaborating with an exclusive brew with a black artist, entrepreneur, or even politician. We have a black mayor coming in and brewing a beer this year. You know what I mean, so like when you're going to these like booths, you're not just like, give me the highest ABV beer. There's a mm -hmm. story 
to each of these booths, you know what I mean, that you go to. And there's so much more than that. So that's why like people come to this festival, like they come in at three, they leave at nine and they go, I want more, which is absolutely <laughs> which crazy. Which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, Don, did you have any other questions? No, I mean, uh, normally I, I, I have tons of questions, but uh, I really just enjoyed day talking about the brewery and, 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 uh, you know, the idea of elevating the community and elevating the whole experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you make it better for the vendors, then they bring their a game, which makes it better for the attendees as well. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a nice virtuous, uh, spiral. It's, yeah. It's, it's got great. a real like street festival because like you can it's a huge you have a huge or at least when I went there was a lot of walk like there was things to like walk to and a lot of space uh, is it going to be similar this year where is it being held this year in Pittsburgh um so it's in strip district um so the one that we had in 2021 was wildly large I think it was like a uh the circumference was like a mile long um there was a gonna... lot of space <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of space. We were coming out of COVID, so we wanted to make mm -hmm. sure that people had a lot of room to just kind of like breathe and whatnot. Um, but, you know, this year we're going to be in a strip district. It's a little bit more succinct, mm -hmm. uh, but still, you know, again, another part of the festival that people love and, and something that I got from women listening to women was that they hated crowded spaces. They hated like these big, burly, you know, drunk men bumping into them all the time and whatnot. Sure. So like creating space was a huge um, issue for women. And mm -hmm. so we do that. So we make sure that, you know, uh, you know, our venue, we're looking at 4,000 people come in, coming in, but the venue has space for about five to 6,000, uh, five to I mean, uh, six to 7,000 people. So like, you know, we're, we're almost at half capacity, um, you know, with this festival, because we don't want to like, again, it's not a cash grab. We want people to be comfortable and to mm -hmm. be able to like, kind of like move around and, and not be shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than when you go to a festival and there's no water station or mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has their like qualms about certain stuff, um, but it's really nice how you kind of thought of everything like that's yeah. incredibly thoughtful of, of of you. Is there I have I do have one more question. Uh, is there any collaboration this year that like you're really, really excited about or are you just excited about all the collaborations that people are um... doing? Well, first, first, the see a statement that I thought of everything. I didn't think of anything. I, everybody else told me what the hell to do, and Did I just you listen. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the most important. Part. Listening is important, <laughs> and I think that that is really the, the takeaway from a lot of this is that if you ask enough questions and if you really care and you listen, you can build a great. Anybody can build a great event. They just have to be, you know, receptive to to feedback. Um, secondly, as far as collaborations go, um, you know, there's there's a few. Um, you know, like Revolution is one of my faves. Uh, they're working with Funky Town, a black owned brewery who started out, um, you know, they came to the fest as guests. They didn't own a brewery. Uh, they were inspired that now they have a brewery and now they're pouring. They poured for the first time last year and now they're collaborating with Revolution this year, which is, you know, just the trajectory of that is, is amazing. Um, we also have a local black brewer, Marcus Wyatt, who owns Windy Bridges Brewing. Um, he's going to be uh, hopefully the first black owned brewery here in the city. Uh, when he first came to Fresh Fest, um, it was, you know, he wasn't brewing um, at all. And then, uh, you know, now he's looking to open up his first brewery here in Pittsburgh. And uh, he's collaborating with Trogues um, out in Hershey, which um, is a powerhouse here in, in PA. And I just think that that's a, an awesome, again, a, a nice story from, you know, within five years, you're going from like curious about brewing to a collaboration with one of the largest yeah. breweries like in the state. Like that's a great story. Uh, I'm excited to, to see that. Um, and then, you know, we have, you know, Allagash coming in um, with uh, Montclair Brewing down in New Jersey. Um, again, a major, you know, collaboration. And then, you know, really liking the fact that, you know, these breweries through the fest and, and other means are able to, you know, build these connections, get their brands beyond their borders or, you know, places that they normally would be, and then gain the experience from, you know, brewing in these larger facilities. Like, you know, like I, a couple of years ago, uh, War Cloud did a collaboration with uh, Jay Wakefield in Florida. And I went down there for the collaboration and like, 
you know, I'm not a brewer. I have zero interest in, in brewing or owning, operating a brewery. And I was always curious, like, what the fuck do people even get from these? Like, right. And, and what I learned was that it's a lot, like they learn different brewing techniques, recipes, um, you know, ways to fill up kegs that save time, you know, in the process. Like there's a lot that these brewers, especially the smaller ones that don't have a lot of uh, brick and mortar experience get from collaborating with these larger breweries. So um, those are the three that kind of come off the top of my head that I'm really excited yes. about this year. That sounds awesome. How do um, the collaborations start? Like do breweries reach out to you or do people reach out? Or is it just kind of friendships or how, do, how, do, how, do, how does this come about? Um, so it's a, it's a combination. So we have an application process, uh, from January through March, um, it's about two months and breweries apply, um, throughout that, uh, some breweries come with their own collaborations. We encourage that if you already know black people, by all means, bring them to the festival. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, some folks are actually looking for, you know, collaborations and whatnot. So then, you know, we, my, myself and my team will go through, we also have a application for collaborators as well. So we'll go through those brewery and collaborator applications and then pair them up based on a myriad of factors, you know, uh, nice. branding, size, location, mission statements, things of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. You know, first year we uh, paired up Helltown Brewing, which has a lot of heavy metal kind of in there, you know, like in their branding with um, an artist, a local artist named Byron Nash who is all about like, you know, heavy metal and guitars and things of that nature. So we paired them up. It was a hit. They ended up brewing that beer for like four years straight. Um, and then Byron ended up becoming the head of marketing. At oh, wow. Um, as of that collaboration. <laughs> so, you know, again, and, and, and if you talk to Byron, he'll tell you, he's like, I didn't know what the hell to expect, you know, driving up to like all these, you know, he was like, I, I'm driving up to all these like white folks. And I don't know what to expect. And then Turns out we hit it off and it was a great opportunity. So like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's the, the collaborative, the, the collaborative aspect of it is by far the most tedious aspect of putting this festival together because it requires so much tact and care, right? Like each one of these folks that are, that are participating in this are established artists, business owners, they have a brand, they've worked their entire lives to build this. And you don't want to be, you know, willy nilly with that in any way, shape or form. You want to respect that. And you want to make sure that like you're putting people in a situation where they will succeed. Right. Um, so it is extremely difficult, but also it is the most rewarding yeah, um, yeah. aspect of that. Because if you see the collaborations that come out, if you, if you, if you, you go to these brewing days and you hear the conversations that the people are having with people that they would have never had conversations with without this, you know, opportunity and whatnot. Um, and then you see like the artwork that comes from it because each of the collaborations, if they package it, need to um, feature the artwork of a paid and accredited black artist. Um, and in doing so, you see some of the most beautiful artwork um, that you'll see on cans as a result of that. And it speaks to a demographic that typically isn't spoken to in this industry. So again, when we say mutually beneficial relationships, this isn't charity that we're doing here. We're actually progressing the industry and teaching people how to interact with their communities in mutually beneficial ways, not charity, not like, okay, well, we're going to do this until it, 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 it doesn't make sense anymore. You're doing it and you're understanding, you're, you're, you're gaining tools and knowledge into different um, communities and areas, which should have done correctly um, help to build your brand and um, your bank account. Um, awesome. Can I ask a one? I have one more question, Dave. Um, you know, I've been in beer for like 20 years and there's tons of beer festivals now. Uh, one festivals that used to be popular, or I think some of them are dying slow deaths uh, because to your point, most of them are trash as you, as you earlier said, and do you find are are other festivals actually reaching out to you and saying, "Hey, you seem to be running a great festival. What should we be doing differently? Like, uh, is there opportunities to help other people that way?" Yeah. So, um, actually, part of my income is a consulting business at this point. So, um, yeah, I consult on you know a couple other festivals. Um, you know, I typically uh, provide the consulting for free for Black folks. Um, but everybody else has to pay, but I mean, yeah, people are reaching out to me all the time going, you know, how do you, you know, can I, can I pick your brain? Can I get a cup of coffee? 
and that coffee is expensive now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. it's a good festival. Well, yeah, you're you're worth the you're worth it because what you have is some really great knowledge about doing events well. And you know there are a lot of events out there that don't do it well. So, I uh, I think very the the very philosophy that you went in asking what is wrong that I can fix as opposed to what is right that I can mimic, I think is exactly, I think is the difference that, uh, that you brought to the table. I think that's incredible. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Day. So Great. Day, how can people learn, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, how can people learn about Barrel and Flow? Are there tickets available still? Cause this is going to come out in a couple of weeks. Like how do, uh, how can people learn more if they want to attend? Uh, Barrelandflow.com. Um, you know, all the information is there. Um, you know, all the applications and things of that nature are closed. Tickets are there. <laughs> Always looking for sponsors. If you, uh, you mean you want to pair up. And we do the work throughout the year. So even if you can't make it to the festival, if you're interested in, you know, the work that we're doing with this festival, you know, it's never a bad time to reach out. Um, like I said, I mean, we're we're constantly doing events. We're doing events like I find myself as a resource coordinator year in. People are always hitting me up going, hey, you know, how do I get in the industry or do you know any artists that I can hire or, you know, I'm trying to build this event or, you know, whatever. So I'm constantly, you know, like checking my emails and plugging people in where they can, um, you know, better themselves. So, again, if you have any questions or want to participate in any way, even if it doesn't happen this year, you know, we're, we're always around. Great. And how can people reach out to you personally, social media or email? Um, I'm at, I'm at Dave Bracey at most things. Um, and then my email is Dave Bracey at Gmail. So, you know, hit cool. me up. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and good luck with Barrel and Flow. It's going to be amazing. I wish I could attend this year. Um, and I've been telling you that I was going to come back when 2021 and I haven't. I'm embarrassed because <laughs> I want to come back. It's such a good one. 2024. So will, here we 2024, go. 2024. 2024. And I mean it. Um, that's a promise. I'm putting it on my calendar now. Um, <laughs> thank you so much uh for your time. And uh yeah, good luck with the festival. We will see you in 2024. Yes, oh, we will. Thank you both for your time and, and your platform. <laughs> cool. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Estrella Galicia is an independent family-owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world-class lager, brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the state-of-the-art facility in Acruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. Looking for an easy hop sourcing experience? Yakima Valley Hops offers the finest quality hops from right here in our valley and premium growing regions around the world. Get the hops you need when you need them with ultra-fast shipping and awesome customer service. With a full line of liquid hop products and all your favorite varieties, no contracts are needed to brew with the best. Shop now at yakimavalleyhops.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A, valleyhops.com. Laura Lodge is the owner of Customated Craft Beer Programs, a consulting business offering insight and assistance with all things craft beer. In addition, Laura is the president and executive director of the well-known Big Beers, Belgians, and Barley Wines Festival held in Breckenridge each year, offers industry support through the BA Mentorship Program for Startups and Advancing Professionals, and is a strategic business advisor for startups, breweries, and distributors. Co-founder of Start a Brewery, author of Distribution Insight for the Craft Brewer, and recognized as a veteran in the craft brewing craft beer industry, she currently splits her time between Cleveland and the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So could you walk us through the evolution and history of the beer festival experience from when you first started into now? I know that is a very large and broad question, but I'd love to know your take on that. Sure. Um, and And in wandering through it, there's a little bit of like anecdotal growth that goes with it that I kind of think speaks to 
a little bit of the evolution of the festival experience, but probably, you know, we're an anomaly, but everybody's an anomaly. So in general, um, the Big Beers, Belgians and Barley Wines Festival began as a trade show that was open to the public. So normal to have a trade show as a distributor if you are looking to give your buyers and your, um, you know, buyers for the liquor stores and the restaurants and and such an opportunity to taste your wares. So that's something that all distributors do. Um, in this case, my brother owned a distribution company that was carrying all of the imports at that time in our area of Colorado, as well as all the new microbrews that nobody understood. And so his goal was to figure out how to connect with anybody and everybody that would request and then buy some of these more expensive beers that nobody understood. So the idea of having a trade show, of course, normal, but then invite the public to come to give them a chance to taste it as well. And hopefully, you know, inspire them to request it and pre-order it from their liquor stores and the restaurants um, was the general premise. So year number one was uh, a whole bunch of, of brewers and importers pouring their wares. And then Adam Avery came and did a vertical tasting hog heaven, which was, you know, cellaring was not a thing at that time for beer. So that was a whole new concept. So in year two, uh, we added the homebrew competition because we needed help. And to my point about homebrewers, um, they are the magic um, for big beers. And it was a wonderful way to offer to them something that was super cool and exciting for them and, and kind of exchange for support with everything else we were doing. So that happened really quickly. And then in year five, Joanne Carilli Stevenson was with White Labs at that time, and she was the inspiration be behind experimental brewing. And so we we started an experimental brewing seminar, and she brought in people like Will Myers from Cambridge and Peter Buchert. And uh, that was the same year that Sam Calagione came out with an invitation from Adam Avery, and they we had our first brewmaster's dinner. So that was a really pivotal year, 2005, for us in terms of how, what big beers looks like and what the experience is, because we're bringing in seminars and we're bringing in dinners. So it was a double beer pairing dinner, one Avery beer and one dogfish head beer with each course, which was not something that was done at that time. Hmm. And then we'll just kind of skip over a whole bunch of stuff. We added a whole bunch of seminars. Um, and by the time we got to 2015, well, I guess 16 is when all the rules change and the pricing went out of the, out of the sky. So we started in Vail. And then um, the price for hotel rooms went through the roof as the Vail Cascade was sold. That wasn't where we were all the time, but that's where we were at that time. And we couldn't find another home in Vail. So that's when we moved to Breckenridge. And it happened at the same time that the Colorado laws changed. And all of a sudden, if we wanted to ask the brewers to donate beer, we had to be a nonprofit. And I'm happy to get into the, the details of that, mm. but it was something that that changed so many things on so many levels that 16 to 17 was a really pivotal time for us. And then we needed to adjust to being in a new town uh, where you could walk to town, um, changed the whole dynamic of what we were doing. A lot of the core things stayed the same, but we were still adjusting to that in 2020, feeling like we'd finally found our feet and we were ready for 21 and then 21 <laughs> never, never happened. So it's been a really interesting journey. And even just to see, like, we started out educating about big beers and Belgian styles and like the, the international things that nobody'd ever heard of. And then that became the trend. And then it was session beers. And then it was, I mean, it's just really been interesting to see people find the Pilsner again and, and to kind of see rare beers go away in some regard. So it's just mm. been an interesting journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's crazy yeah i want to i want to know a little more about how being a nonprofit changed because you said well that was year like 16 so you had already been doing this for a, quite a while and then all of a sudden things had to be different am i getting that right that's correct um we had been working with a nonprofit, the vale valley charitable fund since the first year that we had done the event so so benefiting a charity was nothing new that was something that we felt was you know, part of our identity and part of what we needed to do and be as a festival. It's community engagement. It's you know, all parts of, of you know, just being good humans. And um, I think that that's true with uh, the vast majority, if not like the whole 
beer scene, craft beer in particular, has always been super community engaged and 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 focused on benefiting and and participating and connecting. And um, there's some, and maybe it is in other industries, I don't know, but there's some perception somewhere in the like liquor enforcement governmental zone that the requirement to uh, the requirement to have a special event permit, special event liquor license, which we never had to have because we always had it in a hotel. So we were in somebody else's liquor license or in a restaurant. Um, but the, the perception was that you would partner up, you as a festival organizer would partner up with a nonprofit to look good, to be mm -hmm. able to get that liquor license. And then you would throw them a couple hundred bucks and you would walk away with, with thousands or tens of thousands of dollars and that you were basically using the nonprofit and not benefiting the nonprofit. So all of a sudden it changed to, um, to be that, for example, I couldn't, well, I told you that I couldn't ask the brewers to donate two cases of beer um, anymore without being a nonprofit. And I, I could have passed on becoming a nonprofit, but in that case, I would have to have run all of the ticket sales and all of the expenses through a nonprofit that I was partnering with and asking somebody to you know, run more than $100,000 of income and expense through that nonprofit was too big of an ask. Mm. Um, so it kind of forced us if we wanted to keep the model that we had to, to change and become a nonprofit. It's a very strange sort of perception. And, and everyone in Colorado, for sure, in craft beer world was like, hey, we give back to their our nonprofit more than we make in some cases. And we certainly did for a long time. Um, but I guess the the idea was to be protecting the nonprofits with these changes in legislation. So you you make the money and then the nonprofit pays for, are you paying like volunteers, you're paying for the beer, you're doing all of that stuff. Um, and so the brewer, you buy the beer as a nonprofit and then use it in the beer festival. Is that my, I'm getting that correct? It feels um, very like there's a lot of complexity, like you said, and I just want to make sure that I've, each state is different too, because yes. I know that in Connecticut, where I live, there are certain ways you, you can donate beer and whatnot. But then in Don's in Canada, and I'm sure in Canada, it's completely different too. So it's really interesting to look at it from a beer festival perspective, you know, like how each state has to go about doing this. I didn't even think about how Colorado yeah. would be different from other states. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, Big Beers has long operated, has always operated on the on the request to please donate two cases, only cases of, of each beer that you want to pour. And most of the reason for that was the fact that they were pouring such crazy rare beers that there's no way we would have ever been able to pay any sort of retail for that. Um, but it's not just the donation. You still have to jump through those hoops if you're paying for the beer. Mm. Um, and so if you're paying some sort of in Colorado, it's the the minimum you can compensate somebody if you're paying for beer is their cost. You can't just pay them 25 bucks or a dollar. You have to pay them their cost for the beer. And um, even if you're paying them retail, there's still still the same hoops to jump through in terms of the uh, nonprofit nature of having a special liquor license event permit specifically. Um, so again, you know, in, in this case, the ticket sales would actually have to be set up and run through the nonprofit as well as the expenses. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. <laughs> I think yeah, a, a lot of people lot. don't understand this. Yeah. Yeah. And I talked to the Vale Valley Charitable Fund and, and they they have been amazing. And we like I said, we worked with them for 16 years. And she said, you know, that that totally like screws with who we are and uh, like showing that much income would would really be weird. Mm -hmm. So it it's just, it just was a not good fit and a not good ask for me to be making. So I just said, mm -hmm. okay, we'll, we'll just be a nonprofit. So all of a sudden I had a board of directors and everything was, was different. And then how uh, did that, oh, go ahead, Don. Uh, well, I was going to sort of change tracks a little bit. You were talking sure. about the evolution of beer festivals and, and when, when your festival started, you know, sounds like about 13 years ago, it was trying to showcase these beers uh, for licensee buyers and for consumers to educate them on why these expensive beers might be worth it, why they should order it, why they should buy it, why they should drink it. I think today, the average beer consumer is a little bit more educated than they were 13 years ago. 
question mark. I'm making that a semi sort of yes. as a statement and sort of as a question. You know, a lot of beer lovers can name a favorite hop or whatever. So has your festival changed in terms of what it's trying to, to deliver to the consumer and and I guess to the licensees as well? Um, so a couple of pieces there. We started in 2000. So 2020 was our 20th anniversary. And um, yes, consumers know a whole lot more than they did then. And I think at some point, uh, we are fundamentally, Big Beers is fundamentally a festival that's di- designed around and for the brewers. Mm-hmm. Not that it isn't awesome for the public and not that I don't do any part of it for the public, but it's really designed for and about the brewers. And so I think that, yes, it's changed some, but the nature of them being together to show off the things they're so proud of, that hasn't changed. What they bring to the festival certainly changed, especially with you know the advent of sours and that becoming normal. Um, I think too, though, I, I catch myself pretty regularly thinking that we all know a lot about beer. And, and we, if I make it bigger than the industry, don't. And so I try to keep in mind that we're still always educating people from the ground up and trying to convert that beer drinker who's never had craft beer. And so I guess in some cases, we're still trying to do the basics at the same time that we're trying to offer continuing education for the brewers. And we're trying to get, you know, weird and funky into whatever the, the fun direction is that people are looking to experiment. So we certainly, I mean, we wouldn't have had any reason to talk about hop oils or, you know, cryo hops or things like that in the beginning. Um, And so we've gotten weirder and funkier and maybe more extreme or more, I don't know, gone out a little bit farther with some of the stuff that we do in the seminars and the educational tracks. But we do try to keep it pretty basic when we talk about food and beer pairings and and we have always had craftbeer.com come in and do a session as well. And those are always interesting too, especially when they did the one where everybody was blindfolded and then they did the the, the loud music to see if everything tasted the same. Those kinds of, of things I think are just super interesting. And you can do that with people that are um, usually not one-on-one basic learners. Yeah, that's uh, the people I see because it's, Usually in uh, January, correct? Mm -hmm. Always the weekend before Martin Luther King. So the second weekend in January in a place that's known for skiing. What's the um, what's the the uh, above sea level for Breckenridge? Yeah, it's like nine thousand feet. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. So big big beers at altitude is really interesting. Is that like, yeah, I actually wanted to ask you about that because when I come to Denver every year, um, the altitude and the beer just, I get wrecked. Like it, I get dehydrated. And so I want to know how the festival functions when these, you know, you're drinking these 12, 13% beers. And then do you do anything to, do you do anything differently because of the altitude? It is a destination after all. So is there anything when you're putting on a beer festival that you're mindful about when you're putting on a festival at that, you know, you're on top of a mountain, essentially. Of course. Yes. Yes, we are. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that we have, you know, what is big beers is what we had to do in 2016. You know, when we moved uh, mm-hmm. and changed resorts, it was a big question of who are we and, and what does big beers represent? What do you expect and what would the brewers expect and why are, why are they coming? Right. Um, Altitude is interesting. So there were a number of things that we did that I pretty much consider to be the norm at this point, but it's not everywhere. Um, There's water stations everywhere. Um, There's a food ticket that you get as part of your admission. And um, Mm -hmm. we only do one ounce pours. And another piece that I think is really interesting and it's been very effective is to host it in such a way that it is viewed as a fine dining or high end experience. And I mean that in the sense of, of white tablecloths and, and, you know, glassware, really nice glass when you come in the door and things like that, that kind of, kind of set the expectation for behavior and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you find that it pretty much polices itself. You know, there's security out the wazoo too, but everybody kind of looks at each other and, and, 
and you kind of know when you're getting out of hand and it, it really does limit the issues that we have. It doesn't mean that people are happy the next morning, their head still hurts, but um, I think it does a lot of good on its own. And I don't know how much of that to attribute to each of those pieces, but the food is essential. Uh, the water is essential. And I think the small pores are essential. And I did in about year five, I, I, instead of making it an understood sort of agreement with the brewers, I actually said in my free event stuff, if I ask you to take a break and go get something to eat, please just do it. <laughs> um, you know, because the brewers are there the whole time and the, and the temptation to try all those beers that everybody else is pouring is, is immense. And so it's easy to overdo. And so oh. that was my agreement with them is if I just, if I ask you to take a break, please just do it. How long is the event? Like how many hours? Um, at the beginning, it was six. Um, at In 2020, it was four for the average attendee and, and five if you had VIP admission. Mm -hmm. uh, but VIP admission also included a separate area where you could sit, where you could eat more. Um, so a bigger opportunity for a break and to get outside and on the patio. This, yeah, that's a, I mean, four hours and at 9,000 feet drinking barley wines is, uh, that's a right. real, it's a marathon, right. like a really delicious, wonderful marathon. Right. It's like and altitude training though. Em, you need to practice drinking at altitude. <laughs> oh, then... okay. All right. Well then I will go to Breckenridge and I will let you know. So yeah, I live in go. Calgary. Like I'm ready. I, we are already at like nine, 900 meters. So I'm ready. Okay. There you go. I think <laughs> I think it's also true that the brewers didn't, you know, it's not all high alcohol. So when you say Belgians, you're opening the beer for like a 1% table beer. And there was there was a, a trend at some point with lower ABV sours, uh, lower ABV, like seven was the bottom of the big range. But if you were Belgian, you could, you know, there was no expectation. And there's always a little bit of that policing of the brewery who wants to introduce their brand new 4% session IPA and decides to serve it under the table, which just chaps my ass. But mm. <laughs> if you're going to do that, just make it a Belgian, right? Yeah. Follow the rules. Yes. Yes. That's what they're or, there for. So yeah. Or have them. a special, like there's a festival of wood and barrel aged beers it has this brewer's room where it's just Hellas. So there you go. You know, you, if it's separate, you know, that's where you go for the clean beer, but on the floor, I get it. So yeah. Yeah. So do you do you actually then like ban those breweries or do you do anything uh, to stop that kind of behavior? Um, I usually just bang the drum a little harder or have a word with them the next year and say, "Ed, you can't bring that thing." Right. Okay. Um, I hadn't really banned anybody, but I, I I have to admit it does come into consideration when you're talking about inviting somebody to do seminars. Um, and special events, you know, if it's somebody who keeps doing things like that, it yeah. just doesn't sit well. Right. Right. Hear that everybody follow the rules. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it sounds like you put a lot of thought into a, the, the types of beers you want to pour, but then even like you were talking about tablecloths and everything, you're trying to set a tone, mm -hmm. which, which affects the, everybody's behavior. And if you have people just doing willy nilly things, then it kind of, undermines your ability to 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 control that so i i agree with you on that yeah yeah we're just we're we we're we set it up to be unique and we want to continue to be unique and we don't want to be a festival of you know session ipas if we did that's what we would be right. it would be yeah big big peers barley wines and Session, session, session IPA <laughs> under <laughs> under the table session IPAs. I was exactly. trying to come up with a B. I was like <laughs> below five percent IPAs. <laughs> right, right. Just to keep that in there. You, yeah, <laughs> you had mentioned that you were feeling comfortable by 2020 and everything was good. And then obviously everyone knows what happened in 2020. Uh, how did the pandemic and all the unpredictability of running a festival like change any kind of perception you had about future events? Um, it's it's definitely been a struggle, and it's something that that I like to talk about because I think the awareness of what the festival organizers are dealing with is Im is important. Um, it's in a in a festival like Big Beers we 
are unavoidably crammed into 20,000 square feet of event space. And that doesn't sound cramped, but by the time you add like 150 brewers and 85 tables, and um, it, it becomes shoulder to shoulder in some places. And there's not much we can do other than lean on, crack the windows, um, Beaver Run, who's our host in Breckenridge, has a whole new air handling system, uh, courtesy of the pandemic, which I think was phenomenal. But when you put 1,900 people in a room, or in two rooms in this case, there was an upstairs ballroom and a downstairs ballroom, the idea that that people can exist in that space for a beer tasting with masks on is you know, not real. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if you were to do so well, like CBC did in Minneapolis and require vaccines or testings or whatever, you know, people are still traveling to get there. And so every single person has gone through the airport or has been exposed to other people and are staying in a hotel in contact with other people. And so bringing something like that into the event is is straight up unavoidable. So I think now and in, in, in the future, we really just have this this certainty that we can't be 100% foolproof in terms of being virus proof. I mean, we just, we just, there's no way to do that. We can't achieve that. Um, So it's a known risk. And so you start with that. Yes, you, you are, people may get vaccinated right before they come, which would probably be a best practice. Um, But you're still going to be exposed yourself. You're going to be exposing your team. And all of your guests are going to be exposed to something somehow, regardless. There's the odds are just, they don't exist that you can have a perfect festival in that regard. So that's one level to start with that is is pretty sketchy. And we had decided with, that we would actually take on that risk and, and go with it. And then, you know, inflation in the economy went sideways. And so it's just, it's an interesting dynamic to have a destination event with a, a contract that says you're going to occupy X number of room rates, rooms at X rate um, as, a, as an event, and all of your costs for the event are going up, all of the costs for the brewers for shipping, for the cost of their own beer and making their own beer and operating their own business, all that's going up. Your consumer who's attending, you know, their price of gas and their price of groceries went up. And so it's just an interesting messy stew right now in terms of a destination event. And I think if you're hosting an event in a neighborhood where people are not traveling to get there, or if they are, it's a smaller percentage of your attendees and your, and your participants, I think it's a different kind of strategic equation in terms of does this work? Um, But it's just a very, it's a very difficult time right now to be talking about putting people, especially in the wintertime, inside Hmm. yeah because you never there's so much unpredictability I mean right now we're dealing with all the smoke from Canada and there's you know I didn't think that I would be inside my house for x amount of days Hmm. so there's a lot of unpredictable and we you know who knew so there is a lot of things and like what ifs and whatnot so but will so are you not doing big beers in 2024 or what's Correct. the, what's, so what's the plan going forward? What's the future of the festival? Um, I, I don't know at this point. Um, mm-hmm. I know that we can keep it alive with the homebrew competition, certainly uh, from year to year. So we'll certainly do that portion of the event, but we can have that, you know, in Denver where a lot of the judges live and that's no big stretch for anybody. Um but I really don't know. I, I think that the, the the future of destination events, particularly with the underlying pandemic, particularly in the winter time, particularly in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, where everybody decided it was safe, and all of those hotels and resorts have had fantastic year after year after year now, all of those rates have gone up, and all of the contract expectations have gone up, whereas the rest of the world is fighting weird economy and and cost of living issues. So it's just a, right now it's a tough combination of things. So I don't know what the future is. It's hard to, you know, 
if I had a crystal ball, right, I could tell you when we would be able to start again. Mm -hmm. But I, I think right now, you know, it's particularly coming back after not being um, active or whatever you want to call it for so many years, when we start off, we need to start off with a good expectation that we can make it work, at least break even. Mm -hmm. um, and, and given the higher costs of the event, plus the shakiness of can the brewers afford to come, plus the shakiness of how many people are going to make that trip right now in an era of making trips with all of your friends and family because you didn't get to see them and you understand now that things like this can happen. And so people are, I think, are traveling differently. Hmm. Would you move it or has there been, or are you, or is Breckenridge and the way you do it tied into the location? Like, is there any chance that maybe one day it would be somewhere else or is that not an option for you? Um, well, there's brainstorming all over the board for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in that never say never zone. Uh, so I, I can't rule out anything. Uh, yeah. There's been discussion of having it every two years, three years, five years in the same place in the same way. Mm -hmm. There's been discussion of moving it. There's been discussion of just creating a, like a sister or sibling event um, and, you know, not trying to be big beer somewhere else. Um, I don't know. I, I would, I would really hate to lose big beers. It's, it's done so well and has been so beloved and is such a community like family. Um, mm -hmm. and I know you understand that it would be hard to let it go. Um, again, though, never say never. I mean, we need to be smart about it and be business people also. Mm. Yeah. How, how well, much are the board of directors that you work with? Is it, you guys taught me to talk about that or before everything happened, what was their, um, their role in coming up with and helping with the beer festival? Um, we have a board that has very different backgrounds and very different roles in general. So one of the members of our board is, is, uh, financially finances his thing. And so one of the, the big roles that he played was to, um, look at the financials when we got done with the event and say, okay, we need to reinvent this. We need to twist this. We need to, you know, I would suggest getting rid of this. And so, you know, there are pieces and parts, especially after we moved to Breckenridge, which is when the board was invented anyway, where we had to say, okay, that doesn't make sense anymore. And it was really good for me to be able to have that sounding board to say, I really love that, that part, that event, that specific thing. And to have somebody say, yeah, but it doesn't make any money. You're going to need to to rethink that, reinvent that, do something different with that because it's not working. You can't carry other events with the commercial tasting, which is our our biggest event. Um, and so it was really important to do that. And then we have other board members that are beer aficionados. Um, I have two board members that are attorneys. I've got um, one board oh, member I, that I can't imagine how much fighting there is when there's two attorneys. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I had to get, get that joke in there. Go ahead. Um, but it's, uh, and you know, and then I've got a, a really well-connected board member that kind of took on the communication between the brewers. If I was getting static from people or um, we needed to have kind of that third party voice um, where they didn't want to talk to me or we needed to have somebody that took answers to questions or opinions or whatever, that was that was super nice to have kind of that reinforcement if we were talking about kind of rules or to have that um, we had an issue at the event one year we had a big harassment claim uh, sexual oh. harassment claim that we needed to deal with it was really good to have the board behind me to say okay how do we frame this that's where my attorneys came into play too right how do we frame this how do we set up our harassment policy this was before I, I think it was probably the first year we were in Breck. I don't remember exactly, but it was, how do we frame that? How do we put that out there? How do we formulate it, put it on the website, work with the the person making the claim? I still don't know the identity of the person who is being harassed, but certainly work with the person making the, the claim and, and say, how, how would you help us to shape this? Um, so it, there's there's been a lot of of board support and different like utilization of board talent. And I've really appreciated having that. Hmm. That's very interesting. I just think, I think a lot of people who attend beer festivals, be they brewers or consumers, really don't understand, oh, you know, you just invite a bunch of people and they pour the beer and you take 
you know, you sell tickets and you make money and it, it sounds all so simple. And there's, there's so much thought that goes into, well, like you say, tablecloths and, and harassment policy, like there's, yeah, it's been it's, a lot. And those are very important things as well. Yeah. 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 It's been very, it's been very interesting. And it's also good for people to understand the hard work that goes into that. When we do, for example, beer pairing events, every single beer pairing event has to have a like meeting of the minds between the the chef and the culinarian and the the brewer. There has to be an opportunity for the beer to be sampled by the by the culinarian. And I have learned over the years, one year in particular, um, never to assume that that's going to happen organically and to always be present. Otherwise, it just doesn't get the focus. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, those beer samples that were super priceless to that brewer got consumed as shift beers. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not how this is going to work. And I'm going to be present. I'm going to bring the beers myself. And we're going to sit down and taste all the way through this. And I'm going to bring people with me that can taste with and suggest with and brainstorm as well. So there's a lot of hours and a lot of time just outside of setting up the hotel rooms and the discounted lift tickets and the meeting space. You know, there's a there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on outside of that. So many, yeah, the nuts and bolts of it are like, there's just so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's daunting. And yeah. and it's kind of funny right now in, in complete and total transparent honesty, the idea of picking up that, um, the enormity of that load is only balanced by the awesomeness of that community. Yes. Um, and, the, and the fact that I've got so many people like um, my, my best schol- sponsorship deal ever was I, I negotiated a sponsorship trade with Chris Black at Falling Rock for Beth, his, his Beth Walter, his, his right hand person. I said, I'll trade you a sponsorship for Beth for three days. And all of her <laughs> GABF experience and all the people she brought to the table with her have totally saved my sanity. Hmm. Um, and it's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> But that is a good story. <laughs> it's 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 really interesting to to think through the enormity of that lift. And it just, you know, the pandemic makes you a little more aware of the energy that you've put out previously. And how did you do that? What advice would you give to people who are attending festivals now, like best practices, you know, things that you've seen that you'd love to give consumers uh, who are going to intend, uh, attend some festivals this summer or this winter or whatever? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I think that the the best gift that you as an attendee can give to yourself and to the organizer and the participants is to understand the uniqueness of what they've created and to take the time in your festival experience to do those things. For example, if you're at an event that has a couple of educational sessions or has some special things going on, make a point of taking time to do that. And that's one of the things we've been challenged with as organizers. I helped with Saver, you know, we, I worked with Paired, um, just so many different kinds of experiences in addition to big beers where we work really hard on some of these really neat, unique uh, niche identifying elements that some people have never seen because they get lost in tasting beer and hanging out with their friends and they never take the time to see those things. So I would encourage you to find out why that festival is unique and, and take the time to do it, whatever that is, and appreciate it. Yeah. Don't just that try is. and power through as many samples as you can. Oh, no. That's really a bad idea. <laughs> big. <Yeah. laughs> I, I, I have just said, you know, if you really want to do that, just stand next to the Boston beer table and drink utopias and you'll be done quickly. <laughs> That's true. It's also the best way to get your money's worth, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. You need to, no, the idea you're is out. To, you want to sip as many beers as you can just to try the like creative craft that's really behind it all. Yeah, I really, just, yeah. Good example for any festival is, yeah, you want to sip and learn. Right. And the philosophy of one glass or one sample of beer and one sample of water and alternating is, is a good strategy as well. Yeah. Very, very good. Strategy. Yeah. Stay hydrated, everybody. So. Exactly. Especially at altitude. Yeah. Don, did you have any other questions? I didn't. I just love, uh, I love knowing the kind of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, so it was great. Thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. It's so nice to be able to have an opportunity to 
talk about some of the odd, weird, unique, twisty things that have happened. And, and festivals right now, I think, are facing a lot of challenges. So thank you for the focus on that. Of course, of course. If people want to reach out to you, uh, how should they get in touch? Social media, website? Um, lots of different choices. So we have the Big Beers Festival on Facebook as a group. Um, we're also on Instagram at Big Beers Festival. Uh, you can reach me at Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at bigbeersfestival.com. And um, I, you know, my phone number is everywhere on the website, on the contact us page, all of that kind of stuff. And I certainly welcome any question or discussion. Happy to happy to share our journey with anybody. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm looking forward to going to uh, Big Beers one day in the future. Me I hope too. So. Thank you, Em. Thank yeah. you, Don. <laughs> I'm going to demonstrate to Em the importance of altitude uh, training because I am always training at altitude. And that's well, then you live at altitude, Don, and I live at like 600 feet above sea level. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're going to be the trainer, and Em's going to yep. be the trainee. Yeah, I'll exactly. be the one near the trash can, not trying to barf. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, that'll be me. <laughs> you'll be sipping, and you'll be fine. I will be. I have. You have. When I go to altitude because my sister lives at 8400 feet above sea level um i know i can have a, basically a beer and that's it so that's right. how it works so how many <laughs> sips is that beer we'll try you that many beers all right i love that that, that's <laughs> great idea. that is wonderful all right laura Excellent. thank you so much for all your time and expertise and uh it was great chatting with you today likewise thank you so much cheers laura cheers don i learned a lot <laughs> Yeah, um, as is often the case, and and why I love co-hosting this show with you is that it, it makes me think about things in a way I haven't before. And so I want to be more appreciative when I attend a festival, you know, I, I shouldn't just go and like, oh, I haven't had this beer, let me try it. I should be very tactical in terms of what is this festival trying to present to me and make sure I as a consumer am embracing that opportunity properly rather than just like oh let's taste all the beers <laughs> yeah absolutely so, yeah because there's, am- there's so much that it's not you know again these are festivals that aren't just all about the beer and then maybe there's a band playing wagon wheel in the corner um i mean if they are that i just yeah beers <laughs> in a parking lot kind of thing you know there's thoughtfulness about food there's thoughtfulness about who's attending this festival who's in mind for this festival there's music there's art there's so many water is there for a reason water is there to be drank people hydrate (laughs) hydrate hydrate for the love of god you'll you'll thank me in the morning uh that that's something that i really like about both of the guests we talk to and then festivals that i try to attend is you know yeah it's about beer but it's so much more and that's that's exciting. Yeah. As I yeah. say, every time we talk, I'm always like, I'm excited about what we just learned. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I did want to mention very quickly because Laura uh, mentioned the board of directors for the uh, Big Beers, Belgians and Barlow Wines Festival. Uh, John Hall, who is the editor of All About Beer, uh, it sits on that board. So just in the interest of full disclosure, we want to put Perfect. that out there. But Yes. Um, Good to but say. yeah, I, um, uh, you know, back to having fun, uh, you know, I just, uh, I think that festivals are a great opportunity to not just try beer and, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, learn something. I, I was recently at a little festival that it was only about 20 beers. So maybe you don't even call it a festival, but every single beer there was made, uh, with, uh, well, first of all, it was all, they were all lagers and mm. they're all fermented by a unique, uh, a lager strain that was, uh, wild captured, um, in Virginia. Uh, and then all of the malt came from a uh, craft maltster in uh, North Carolina. And like um, getting to taste 20 of those beers side by side by side by side was absolutely amazing. And and that's what festivals can do because you can't do that in a tap room. You can't do that by going to your local liquor store. Um, and, and it's those unique experiences that I love about beer festivals. That's that's really cool. That sounds awesome. And, and like going to meet the people that make it too, or going to meet people that work for the breweries, asking them questions because they'll know the answer. That's mm-hmm. what I really like when I go to a festival is meeting the people behind the beer. That's always a lot of fun as well. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yes.
So anyway, visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer. And if you are feeling generous, visit our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. And if you have any questions for the experts, email podcast at allaboutbeer.com. That's the email for feedback, suggestions, or to inquire about supporting the show through advertising. Speaking of advertising, how about a short word from our sponsors? Looking for an easy hop sourcing experience? Yakima Valley Hops offers the finest quality hops from right here in our valley and premium growing regions around the world. Get the hops you need when you need them with ultra fast shipping and awesome customer service. With a full line of liquid hop products and all your favorite varieties, no contracts are needed to brew with the best. Shop now at yakimavalleyhops.com. That's Y-A-K-I-M-A, valleyhops.com. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. Estrella Galicia is an independent, family-owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world-class lager, brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the -the state-of-the-art facility in Acruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. Before we go, if you like this podcast, one easy thing you can do to help us is to give us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting app. That helps other people find the show. We would also appreciate it if you would let your beer-loving friends know about the show and help spread the gospel of good beer. So, Don, how can people reach out to you? Oh, people can drop me an email. I am Don at thedawnofbeer.com. And then on Twitter and on Instagram, my handle is at the Dawn of Beer. And yourself, Em? I am at Pints and Panels across all so- social media. And my website is pintsandpanels.com. This show is produced by All About Beer. Visit allaboutbeer.com for articles, notes on this show, and others, and to connect via the newsletter and social media. Cheers. Cheers. Don't forget to drink at altitude. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs>